Hello, and thank you to everyone who has taken time to join us today. My name is Cameron McElhenney, and I serve as the executive, uh, executive Director of the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. I'd like to welcome each of you today as we continue the 2023 webinar series. NACOL is an organization that works to create a community of support for independent civilian oversight entities that seek to make their local law enforcement agencies, jails, and prisons more transparent, accountable, and responsive to the communities that they serve. One piece of that effort is this webinar series where for the last eight years, we have brought you information on effective practices in civilian oversight, innovations in the field, and important work being done in regards to the criminal justice reform around the country. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics regarding today's session. With so many in attendance, everyone has entered in listen-only mode. However, once today's session starts, uh, you can access the area to type in your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You will also have the ability to vote on questions as they are posed by your fellow attendees to move them up in the queue. This, was, this will help us to address your most pressing questions in the short time that we have together today. I also wanna remind you that today's session is being recorded and will be available to you through the attendee hub platform that you're currently on. The same platform you have just signed into to access today's live session. Your same login information will allow you to watch or rewatch the session shortly after we conclude. Therefore, please save the link to use in the future. With these details out of the way, I'd like to move our attention to today's session. I'm particularly excited mm -hmm. to have member Ashley Heiberger with us today to discuss the evolution of use of force. However, before I turn things over to Ashley, I'd like to welcome Jason Wechter, a longtime member of, civilian, of the civilian oversight community, an at-large NACO board member, and chair of our training, education, and standards committee. Jason? Thank you, Cami, and thank you, Ashley. I, too, am very excited about this presentation, which in many ways is a complement to last month's webinar on Understanding Use of Force in Arrests, which you can now access for free on the NACO website. Uh, Ashley Heiberger, uh, who has tremendous expertise in this area, is a retired police officer with significant expertise relating to use of force, including policy, training, and incident assessment. He spent several years on a team evaluating agency compliance pursuant to several uh, to Federal Department of Justice oversight. He maintains a consulting and expert witness practice involving criminal prosecution and defense and civil litigation. He is currently a member of the NACOL Training, Education, and Standards Committee and the Certified Practitioner of Oversight Subcommittee. And I'm very proud that he's a colleague of mine. So thank you, Ashley. Take it away. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to Cami as well. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'd also like to thank all the NACOL members that took time out of their busy schedules to join us here this morning. Hopefully, the information that we address today will be beneficial. Okay. okay, before we get too deep into it, just have a little housekeeping with this disclaimer. Essentially, that says nothing that I say is legal advice, nothing that you're given meaning the handout, is legal advice. And if you want legal advice, you have to ask your lawyer because that ain't me. There is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out anytime in the future, whether you have a specific question, comment, concern about this webinar, or just something relating to force in general. I'm always happy to engage with people in the field around these issues. A bit about my background. I spent the majority of my police career in the Bethlehem Police Department in Pennsylvania, about 150 sworn officers during most of my time there, a uh, population of about 78,000 people. I retired from active policing in 2017. I took a position as a senior policy advisor with Rosenbaum and Associates. They were working on the Department of Justice, monitoring and compliance in Portland, Oregon. I have about 15 years of experience teaching undergraduates as an adjunct at Moravian, also in Bethlehem. And I was recently appointed a senior fellow at the Excellence in Policing and Public Safety Program at USC Law in Columbia, South Carolina. And as Jason mentioned, I have my own consulting and expert witness practice. And in totality, all those activities keep me pretty busy. 
So just by fact that you are on this webinar, I'm sure you recognize that photograph, if not the specific date. It changed policing. I'm equally sure you recognize that photograph and that date. It also affected policing. And more recently, I'm sure you all recognize that photo and that date as well. Additionally, it affected policing. So here's a proposition upon which we can all agree. And you saw what I did there, right? If you didn't get that, see me later. I believe that there's been a huge change, a sea change, if you will, in the amount of scrutiny that society applies to police use of force events. I mean, if we look at today, as opposed to a few decades ago, I think you'll agree with me that there has been significant change. I like to get this out of the way because there's been some confusion in the past. Simply because I've mentioned this incident doesn't mean that I'm rendering an opinion on it. I'm just counting it. What we see there is approximately a 20 year period a few years ago, and there are six high profile use of force events listed. I believe that most adults in the world are familiar with those six. Now, were those six the only high profile use of force events that took place in that 20 years? Probably not. But I think those are the ones that everyone is familiar with. We all know what happened with Rodney King in LA. The next year, Malice Green beaten by Detroit police officers with heavy flashlights so severely that the medical examiner was unable to determine how many skull fractures he had. New York City in 94, Anthony Baez uh, choked out by an NYPD officer in an incident that began with the youth striking the officer's car with a football. 1999, also in New York, Amadou Diallo in the 41 shots. 10 years later in Oakland, Oscar Grant on the BART platform, if you saw the movie Fruitvale Station. And then the next year, 2010, in Seattle, the native woodcarver, John T. Williams. Again, those were probably not the only high profile police use of force incidents occurring in that period. But those are the ones that most of us know about. There were probably many, many others. And the real the reason I believe is because during that time period, societal responses, community responses, the use of force events were isolated and local. That's no longer the case. Look at this list starting in 2014. Again, by being on this website, the virtue of your professional interest or just personal interest being an adult living in America, you're probably familiar with those names the locations, or perhaps some body cam video from all these incidents. We've seen those all. I believe that the reason that we are all much more familiar with so many more incidents is because that now societal responses to use of force has evolved to the point where they are national and local. And I believe that has a lot to do with this right here. Not specifically my phone, but just the way the public media and social media acquires and disseminates information. It's changed dramatically. And one impact of that change is the fact that society is responding on a coordinated national basis to high profile use of force incidents. If we look back a few years ago to the summer of 2020 in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident, we see that there were about 10,700 events that summer, and the vast majority of them, about 95%, were peaceful. Unfortunately, we saw a small number, about 5%, were violent. They involved uh, property damage and injury, We're referring to incidents that took place in Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, Denver, D.C., and Philly. But again, the vast majority of those community-based responses were peaceful. So if we acknowledge that society is paying more attention to force and they're actively responding to police uses of force, I would say that policing as a profession needs to increase its focus on force. And one of the key components there is how force is evaluated. So you're going to get the classic lawyer answer. It depends. You might ask why it depends. It depends because there's five force evaluation standards. We'll take a look at each of those in turn. The first, and arguably the most serious, is the criminal standard. Now, I fully understand that officers can get rung up on criminal prosecution by federal authorities, 
However, this much more commonly takes place in state court. The second is the constitutional standard. And I'm fully aware that you can bring constitutional claims in state court. However, that's rarely done. Uh, that doesn't happen too often for what I believe are two primary reasons. The first being there's no cap on damages in federal court. And the second is the ability of a prevailing plaintiff's attorney to have their fees paid if they win. So for those reasons, most constitutional litigation takes place in federal court. Third, we have the agency administrative standard, which we typically refer to informally as policy standard, as in what's the department's policy on use of force. Additionally, there's a community standard. The community standard is informal and its influence is largely based on how responsive elected officials in a particular community are to the citizens' concerns. Um, different places have different views on that. It plays out differently, uh, sometimes in communities right next to each other. And lastly, there's an international standard. I wasn't aware of the international standard until fairly recently. And I think that's because in general, as Americans, we tend to pay less attention to international standards than what we do within our own borders. So just for your edification, there's the information regarding the international standard. Uh, I find it somewhat amusing that it was adopted in Havana because I never pictured the current Cuban government as being particularly concerned with human rights, but that's another story. So what that tells us, these five separate standards, they tell us that the same use of force might be justified or unjustified depending on the standard under which it's applied. You can have an incident that's a constitutional deprivation, meaning someone's rights were violated, but the officer did not commit a crime. Or we can have a crime that's not a constitutional violation. And another situation that occurs is the officer may have violated agency policy and they might be subject to disciplinary action up to and including termination, but that use of force was not a constitutional violation nor a crime. If you have any interest in the five separate standards for use of force evaluation or use of force evaluation in general, this is an excellent resource. Um, it's not that expensive in paperback. I would encourage you to uh, read that if you have the opportunity. So let's talk about how these standards have changed. I think it's fair to say that the international standard has not changed at all since its adoption. But again, in the United States, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to that. Constitutionally, there hasn't been much significant change. I mean, appellate decisions come down every month that might nibble around the edges, but we haven't seen a whole lot of significant change to the constitutional standard, with one notable exception that we'll discuss a little bit later. As far as criminal statutes, there has been some moderate change in those of the last couple of years. I know California in 2019 made some big changes to their statute, and a couple other states have made some, some less comprehensive changes. But I think we're seeing the most significant change within agency and community standards. I think that's where most of the discussion and the results have been focused. So let's take a look at officer-involved shootings in the United States. I have up on this slide the number of fatal officer-involved shootings uh, from 2022 back to 2015. You might wonder why it starts with 2015. That's because prior to then, we were relying on federal government statistics sent up and communicated through the FBI. And if you recall, that number was typically between 400 and 500 per year. Yes, we were undercounting the number of fatal police shootings by at least a half. And how did we get a better handle on that number? Again, it wasn't the feds or any other governmental agency. It was the Washington Post and other media and activists. So don't get me started about the failure of our government to have an accurate number of the most significant exercise of the authority that we give to police. We rely on the media for that number. If any of you are familiar with the work of Peter Moskos, he's a professor at John Jay. As you can see, he's got a significant Ivy League pedigree, but he also spent a year as a Baltimore police officer. He wrote a book about his experiences called Cop in the Hood. Uh, I'd encourage all of you to read that as well. 
Now, what Dr. Moscos did in 2023 was he released some research where he compared officer-involved shootings in the 1970s to a more current period, that being 2015 to 2021. He looked at 18 cities and he compared their number of total annual officer-involved shootings, as well as calculating their fatal rate per 100,000 citizens. And here's what he found. Uh, just take a look at that. Those are decreases from some of our biggest cities, very, very significant decreases. Overall, he found there was a 69% drop in the fatal officer-involved shooting rate per 100,000 citizens and a 65% drop in the raw numbers of total annual shootings, very significant decline over those five decades. Take a quick detour here now because the question always comes up as to how many non-fatal officer-involved shootings do we have? In other words, an officer shoots someone, but the subject is not killed. The answer that I typically get, no matter where I ask this question, is that the number of non-fatal officer-involved shootings has not been determined to a reasonable degree of certainty. Um, I'll do you a favor and translate that academic ease for you. It means we don't know. We've got some, some estimates out there, but as you can see, there's a range in those estimates. Um, our friend Dave Klinger, the former LAPD cop who wrote Into the Kill Zone, another excellent book that I highly recommend for anyone interested in the use of deadly force by police. He's at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and his estimate is about 1,400 to 1,500 non-fatal officer-involved shootings per year. You can trust that, contrast that with our buddy Nixie, who's out there at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, He's a little bit lower there at 820. Um, but again, the caveat, we really don't know. Here's some more information. This was regarding firearms discharge. And I've put some emphasis on discharge because it doesn't necessarily mean that someone was shot and killed or even that they were struck. It just simply means that an NYPD officer fired their weapon. I mean, if we look at those numbers in the 70s, it's probably not a big surprise. Uh, we know how New York City was during the 1970s, um, you know, 4-1, Fort Apache in the South Bronx at a time when New York was experiencing 2,000 plus homicides every year. But what else jumps out at us about those numbers? I mean, look at the 80s and the 90s. I find that interesting because there was a lot going on in New York City in the 90s. Um, in the late 80s and the early 90s, we also saw more than 2,000 homicides every year. I believe 1990, they had over 2,600 homicides. And in 1991, I believe it was 2,571. And so there was a lot going on there. I think the criminologists attribute that to the crack epidemic. Um, we all know what was going on in the 75 precinct in East New York from Jamaica Avenue down to Starrett City. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, look at that comparison. The number of homicides might have gone up somewhat, but the numbers of firearm discharges have gone way down compared to the 1970s. And look at the more contemporary numbers. But again, 1970s through the 10s, teens, we're looking at the high went down 89%, the low went down 91%. Uh, very significant drop in firearms discharges in New York. So let's talk about the criminal standard for a moment. Um, if we as a society have granted our police the ability to take a life when justified, the other side of that coin then, the ultimate sanction, is criminal prosecution for misusing that authority. And we, I think we all intuitively understand that some things are wrong just because they're wrong. Um, the technical term for that is mala in se, it's inherently wrong. But in this atmosphere, force is a legitimate tool for police in many situations. So the challenge for prosecutors is they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, because remember, we're operating under the criminal standard, beyond a reasonable doubt, the officer used their force unlawfully. And that's that's a pretty challenging standard, as well it should be. Uh, down at Bowling Green State University, there's an outfit called the Police Integrity Research Group. It's operated by Phil Stinson, who has a JD and a PhD. I don't know about you, but that combination just makes my head hurt. He's the PI down there, and he's assisted by his right hand there, Chloe Wensloff. And they take a look at all types of police criminality. I find them most helpful for the information relating to police officers charged with homicide or murder for an on-duty shooting. 
if we go back to that number we talked about a few minutes ago, there's about a thousand fatal officer involved shootings every year. And so in that period of 2005 up until February 20, February 17th of 2023, there have been 173 officers arrested for homicide. I've broken that down into three sort of periods, if you will. Um, historically, we're looking at 2005 to 2014, sort of the pre-Ferguson era. And there were 54 arrests there, averaging about 5.4 a year. Then from 2015 to 2019, we have what I think of as the post-Ferguson period. And we saw a significant jump, 61 arrests, the average being over 12 per year, more than one a month. And then 2020 through February 17th of 2023, what I think of as the post-Floyd period, we saw 58 arrests. That average is up to over 18 per year. Now, again, I have a JD. I don't have a PhD. I'm not a statistician. But I understand that we're working with relatively small numbers. So statistically, that might not be a big increase. But from a policing perspective or a police oversight perspective, I think that jump from 5.4 to 12.2 to 18.3 is incredibly significant. There they are broken down by year in both the post-Floyd and post-Ferguson periods. Again, the backdrop is about 1,000 fatal officer-involved shootings per year. Uh, during that period, 55 officers have been convicted. That gets an asterisk because it's not necessarily convicted of murder or homicide, but convicted of something, as we'll see in a moment. The breakdown is those convictions, 33 have been by jury trials, 21 by guilty plea, probably pursuant to some type of negotiated agreement. And there was one bench trial. I have to narrow it down a little bit further. I know it took place between March of 21 and March of 22, but to date, that was the only time a police officer has been convicted by a judge. There you can see the breakdown of the crimes for which they were convicted. As you can imagine, the manslaughter and the murders up at the top there, some homicides, but even some lesser crimes down towards the bottom of that list. Again, I think most likely pursuant to some type of negotiated plea. Uh, following convictions, we look at sentencing. For those seven officers that were convicted of murder, that range was about six and three quarter years to life, with the average being about 18 and a quarter years. For the 32 convicted of manslaughter and six of homicide, the range was nothing to 40 years, with the average being just under five and a half years. For non-convictions, you see the 35 acquittals by juries, 11 dismissals by judges, 11 dismissed by prosecutors. There was eight acquittals at bench trials. As I mentioned, that number had been eight and zero. It's now eight and one. Uh, three times the grand jury did not return an indictment. And there was one deferred adjudication, which is probably just a procedural quirk in, in that jurisdiction. So as far as those 173 officers that have been charged, we've seen 55 convictions, 69 non-convictions, and we've got 49 still in the pipe. Moving on from the criminal to the constitutional standard, the history buffs, I've got the dates up there, and the quote from the Fourth Amendment, you can see that the Fourth Amendment specifically protects people against unreasonable seizures, and that's important. The Fourth Amendment regulates seizures. As a practical matter, if there's not a seizure, there could be no Fourth Amendment implication. If the Fourth Amendment is not implicated, there could be no liability, at least not under the Fourth Amendment. Keep in mind that that's not necessarily dispositive. You can still have problems in a whole lot of other areas, but if there's no seizure, there can be no Fourth Amendment liability. The constitutional standard plays into um, most frequently when a civil suit is brought by a private person against an officer or a political subdivision. There is a much smaller number of times it's implicated when federal authorities criminally prosecute an officer. And then there's a much smaller number of times the constitutional standard is at issue when the United States Department of Justice brings a civil suit against the municipality. We'll talk about each of those in more detail. So again, most often you'll see the constitutional standard implicated in a lawsuit. Um, Title 42 of the United States Code, Section 1983, titled the Civil Action for Deprivation of Rights. 
this statute doesn't create any substantive rights. It doesn't give you any new rights. It's simply the mechanism by which your Fourth Amendment or any other constitutional rights are able to be vindicated. This is your way of getting into federal court if you believe the police violated your rights with the use of force. And again, that's where most of the constitutional activity takes place. It's in these private lawsuits brought under Section 1983. It also comes into play when the federal authorities believe that police officers or anyone else acting under color of law has so egregiously violated someone's constitutional rights that they need to be criminally prosecuted. The statute is Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 242, titled Deprivation of Rights Under Color of Law. We saw this back in the day with the Rodney King cops. More recently, we saw it with Michael Slager in South Carolina, and even more recently with the George Floyd cops and the Breonna Taylor cops. They were charged under Title 18, United States Code, Section 242 by federal authorities. And lastly, we have the ability of the Department of Justice to bring a civil suit for a pattern or practice of deprivation of rights. Um, in the 94 Prime Bill, there was provision that was codified at Title 42 United States Code, Section 14141, that created a cause of action. It was sometimes referred to as the Law Enforcement Misconduct Statute or the Pattern or Practice Statute. What that means as a practical matter is that the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division Special Litigation Section, is able to open an investigation into a municipality. They do that, that typically takes 18 months to two years, somewhere in that neighborhood. And if they find a pattern or practice of constitutional deprivations, they file a lawsuit in federal court suing the municipality to take over operations of that law enforcement agency. Now, that typically doesn't occur because the municipalities will consent to oversight. That's why the documents that specify the improvement standards are referred to as consent decrees. And there are several of those going on. Just one quick note, uh, section 14141 was recodified at Title 34 of the United States Code, section 12601. Um, that doesn't seem to have the same ring to it. So most of us in the field still talk about the former section 14141. But remember, that's the statute that gives the Department of Justice the ability to investigate and bring suits against agencies for pattern or practices of constitutional deprivations. We've seen that the very first one was in Pittsburgh in 1997, followed by the New Jersey State Police in 99 and the LAPD in 2000. Um, other significant ones, Seattle, New Orleans, and Baltimore. And I know they're in the process um, in Louisville, even as we speak. So what is the constitutional standard relating to force? Uh, deadly force was addressed by the United States Supreme Court in a 1985 case called Tennessee versus Garner, which gave us a rule regarding deadly force, that is to say a seizure, against a fleeing subject. So let's take a look at the facts of Garner. Um, on the evening of Thursday, October 3rd, 1974, the Memphis Police Department was called by a resident who told them that no one was home at the house next door. They heard what sounded like glass was breaking. They thought there might be a burglar or a prowler up to no good. So the Memphis Police Department responded. Two officers showed up. One went to the front, the other went around the side. The officer who went around the side of the house, he heard a door slam. He saw a figure running across the yard. He illuminated the subject with his flashlight. He could clearly see the subject's face. He thought it was a male, about 15 or 16, maybe 5'5 five, five to 5'8. Five, and in the officer's own words, he was pretty sure the subject was unarmed. The subject was running towards a six foot chain link fence. The officer gave commands for the subject to halt. Um, the subject started climbing the fence. The officer figured, probably correctly, that if the subject made it over the fence, he was gonna get gone and that was gonna be that. So the officer drew his handgun and fired striking the subject uh, in the back of the head as he was climbing the fence. And 15-year-old Edward Garner died on the operating table. Now, to us, sitting here in 2023, that sounds crazy. But keep in mind that under uh, in 1974, 
that shooting was legal under Tennessee state law, and it was within Memphis Police Department policy. Naturally, that did not sit well with the Garner family. They filed a federal civil rights lawsuit that made its way all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, which in 1985 gave us the rule regarding deadly force as it applies to a fleeing subject. That rule is that deadly force may be used against a fleeing subject only when that fleeing subject play, poses an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or others. So in other words, deadly force may not be used solely to prevent escape. And that remains the state of the constitutional law today on that topic. Four years later, the United States Supreme Court uh, once again reviewed that huge force, this time force more generally in a case called Graham versus Connor. They, arrest, they addressed force within the context of an arrest, stop, or other seizure, and talked about objective reasonableness. So again, let's take a look at the facts of Graham. On Monday, November 12th, 1984, a black man named Thorne Graham was at home in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was a patch foreman for the North Carolina Department of Transportation. He was in charge of a crew of guys that went out and fixed potholes. And he was also a type 1 diabetic. He was at home. Uh, rebuilding an automatic transmission, and he felt the diabetic episode coming on. So he called a friend of his, William Berry, and he asked him to take him to a nearby pilot convenience store so he'd get something to uh, stave off that reaction. So for Barry, this was a pretty serious thing. He thought Connor was in distress. So he drove a little quickly to the convenience store. He, he pulled in and parked kind of abruptly. Graham jumped out of the passenger side, ran into the convenience store, uh, took some orange juice from the cooler, got in line to pay for it. He saw there was about five or six people in line ahead of him. He decided that was going to be too long to wait. He set down the orange juice, put it on the counter, ran back outside, jumped in the car, and asked Barry to take him to another friend's house. Again, for Barry, this is kind of a big deal, so he pulls out of the lot abruptly and drives away probably a little faster than he should. Now, again, for us sitting here in 2023, that all makes perfect sense. But if you're M.S. Connor, a Charlotte police officer who also happened to be black, sitting across the street, what do you think you just saw? Yes, you're suspicious that it was a robbery. So they stopped the vehicle, and that stop did not go well for Graham. He had a, a bruised forehead, some cuts and bruises, a broken foot. And again, he wasn't happy about that. He filed a federal civil rights lawsuit that made its way all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the beauty of the Graham decision, is that typically when courts rule on police use of force, it's a strict yay or nay. Thumbs up, thumbs down, justified, not justified. But what the court did in Graham was they said, hey, law enforcement, pay attention to here. We are going to tell you exactly how we are going to evaluate your use of force from here on out. And they do that through the evaluation of several factors. It's a non-exhaustive list. And the Graham factors, as they're known, are the severity of the crime at issue, the threat to the safety of officer or others, and whether the suspect was actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. Now, some legal scholars, some legal commentators, people much smarter than I, they call those three Graham factors. I prefer to think of it as five because I've broken it down with the S, T, the A, the R, and the E, because that creates the acronym STARE, which is a very handy memory device. Uh, once I learned that, again, I didn't create it, but once I learned that, I used that every time I had to write a report documenting my use of force to ensure I had all the required information in there. Later, when I became a supervisor and I was responsible for reviewing other officers' use of force, I used that again as a memory device to ensure they had included all the required information. So I give that to you. Feel free to use it. No additional charge. The first grand factor is severity. A key point here, the initial crime is not dispositive. We have to evaluate from the perspective of the most serious crime. An example I like to use is, if a retail suspect draws a firearm and points it at a police officer, is it still just a shoplifting incident? Obviously not. We have to focus on the most serious crime involved when we're evaluating the severity. The threat to the safety of officer or others. And here we have to clarify what exactly threat is. Threat is not risk. Threat is not danger, threat is threat. Now certainly risk and danger are related to each other and both are related to threat. Threat is a very specific situation that requires all three elements, those elements being ability, 
opportunity and intent. Someone can have the ability and the opportunity to harm you, but if they don't intend to, there's not a threat and vice versa. If they have the intent and the opportunity, but lack the ability, there can be no threat. So what I'd like you to take from this is this idea that risk is not threat, danger is not threat. Risk and danger are related and they can both be related to threat, but threat specifically requires all three elements, those being ability, opportunity, and intent. Another point from Graham is that when we're looking at reasonableness, we evaluate it from the perspective of the reasonable officer on the scene rather than the 2020 vision of hindsight. Now, sometimes there's some misunderstandings relating to this 2020 hindsight prohibition. That doesn't mean that we as supervisors or we as oversight professionals or even the public don't go back and evaluate officer performance. No, absolutely not. What that means is that we don't take information gathered after the fact and apply it to the officer in the moment. We have to look at what they knew, when they knew it, and what decisions did they make after the fact. You know, thinking of it in terms of a timeline, we assess left to right. So once again, the 2020 hindsight does not mean that we do not evaluate officer performance. It means that we do not impute knowledge gained after the fact to the officer in the moment. Um, another key case is Therese versus Madrid, a United States Supreme Court case handed down in 2021. And this case expanded the definition of a seizure. Remember that there must be a seizure in order for the Fourth Amendment to be implicated, which is why this case is important to the use of force. Um, early in the morning of Tuesday, July 15th, 2014, uh, four New Mexico State Police officers were in the parking lot outside an apartment complex in Albuquerque. They had a warrant for a particular woman and they saw Roxanne Torres and another woman standing next to um, a Toyota FJ. And I think you all know that FJ stands for fake Jeep, fake Jeep. They were relatively certain that neither of the women was the subject of the warrant. So they just wanted to approach them and ask them some questions. Now, Therese, by her own admission and in her own words, she was tripping out on meth. So when the officers approached her to ask questions, she thought they were attempting to carjack her and she tried to drive away. The officers responded by thir firing 13 times. They struck her twice. She continued to drive away. She drove a short distance away where she stopped and told a bystander to call the police about what she perceived to be as a, high, a carjacking. She then stole a Kia Soul. Clearly her taste in vehicles had not improved. She stole a Kia Soul and drove 75 miles from Albuquerque to Grants, New Mexico. Unfortunately for Roxanne Therese, the hospital in Grants, New Mexico did not have the trauma capabilities to properly treat her injuries and she was airlifted back to Albuquerque, where she was arrested the next day. In the civil suit, uh, the appellate courts, they followed the old definition of a seizure that required the individual's movements to be terminated. In other words, in order for it to be a seizure, you had to be stopped. Well, in this case, the Supreme Court changed that. They said that the application of physical force to the body of a person with intent to restrain is a seizure, even if the force does not succeed in subduing the purpose person. So under Torres, the universe of seizures is expanded to include situations where the person is not stopped. In other words, if you're shot like Torres was, and it doesn't stop you, you're able to get away like Torres did, that is still a seizure. So this case expanded the definition of seizure, thereby expanding the definition of incidents that implement or implicate the Fourth Amendment. So moving on, let's talk about a concept that's getting a lot more attention um, post Floyd, and that's the duty to intervene. And the duty to intervene sounds very simple, just as words on paper. I mean, all officers, not only supervisors, and pay attention to that because there's going to be a theme developing, but all officers have an affirmative duty to intervene on behalf of a citizen whose constitutional rights are being violated in their presence by other officers. And this doctrine can have civil and criminal applications. 
basically, you have a duty to intervene if you're an officer and you observe this. Let's unpack this a little further. The United States Department of Justice takes this pretty seriously. Um, that's been on their website in February 2019. I've bolded the word prosecuted to emphasize that we are talking federal criminal prosecution for failing to intervene. I'm not talking about just, um, you know, administrative punishments, you know, where you might get suspended or lose your job, or even uh, constitutional deprivation where your insurance carrier might write a check to compensate someone for constitutional deprivation. This is talking about being a criminal defendant in federal court prosecuted by an assistant United States attorney. So that's February 2019. They got a little more explicit July 6th of 2020. Again, I've highlighted prosecuted to show the nature of this proceeding. So this duty to intervene is pretty simple to understand. It means that you can be liable for injuries caused by your coworkers. And as I mentioned, it's been getting a lot of attention post Floyd, but it's not new. Let's look at Priester versus the city of Riviera Beach, an 11th Circuit case from 2000. There, the 11th Circuit said, when they were talking about a 1994 incident, that the duty to intervene was clearly established. And Priester quoted an 11th Circuit case from 86 called Bird, and the quote is right there. Again, whether supervisory or not, this duty applies to every police officer. And the 11th Circuit bird, they quoted a 1972 Seventh Circuit bird that says essentially the same thing with that additional emphasis on non-supervisory officers. So what happened with Priester was, if you can imagine the court just breaking this down, hey, it's 2000, we're telling you you should have known in 94, because we told you in 86, when we told you in 86, we referenced something from 72. Let's take a moment and look at those numbers. What do those dates tell us? That means that duty's been around since at least 1972. That's over 50 years, folks. That's five decades. I tend not to speak in absolutes, but I think it's a pretty safe bet. There's very few police officers working with careers spanning more than 50 years. So I think the ability to say, I was unaware I had a duty to intervene, that's not going to fly anymore. How does it get established? Uh, the Seventh Circuit has a jury instruction that's very, very clear. Talks about an officer using excessive force. Second officer knew that the first officer was using or about to use. The two key elements, the realistic opportunity to stop it and taking a failure to take reasonable steps to stop it. Very simple. Unpack these a little bit. A realistic opportunity to intervene, I think that's going to depend on the duration of the force. Are we talking about one extra punch or one extra kick, or was it an extended beating? Similarly, I think the reasonable steps to intervene, I think the level of force is going to be significant there. We saw that the um, George Floyd cops were jammed up over failure to intervene, as well as uh, failure to provide medical care and aid. But here's my thing. I think the Floyd case is an outlier, um, just and thankfully so. But for that reason, I don't think it's particularly helpful to show us what we actually expect officers to do in failure to intervene situations or duty to intervene situations. So I think it's helpful to look at some things that have been going on in Colorado. Um, in 2020, Colorado passed a police reform statute that criminalized the duty to intervene, failure to intervene. They made it a misdemeanor, and they would yank your post certification. About a week later, up in Loveland, um, officers Hop and Jalali, they arrested a 73-year-old woman with dementia over some stuff going on in Walmart, um, $13 to $15 value. And Officer Hop used force on Ms. Garner, broke her arm, sprained her wrist, separated her shoulder. April 2021, they resign, probably because they know what's coming. Um, May 19th, Hop gets charged. The list is there, no surprises. But his partner was charged with failure to intervene, failure to report, and official misconduct. Keep in mind, criminal charges. Uh, March 2nd, he takes a plea to assault, and uh, he gets five years incarceration. Um, he's only there a couple of months, and he asked for work release. That was denied. But most clearly here, related to the duty to intervene, you can see that his partner, took a plea on that failure to intervene, one count, uh, 45 days in jail, and I found this fascinating, a mental health evaluation, a 
a mental health evaluation was part of that agreement. And then three years of probation and 250 hours of community service. So sometimes I get questioned, well, this officer believed it was in her best interest to take the plea. What happens if an officer is not willing to roll over and they want to go to trial? Well, let's take a look at another case in Colorado. Same statute from 2020, about a year later, up in Aurora, uh, two officers, Hobart Martinez, they have a warrant for a man named Kyle Vinson, who uh, happened to be black, happened to be homeless at the time, and Officer Hobart tuned him up pretty good. He was led to a pistol, whipped him, and strangled him. Three days later, Hobart gets charged. There's the laundry list. But again, the partner, Officer Martinez, charged with failure to intervene and failure to report. The next spring, she files a motion to dismiss attacking the statute, saying it's void for vagueness. It says the legislature did not find did not define intervention. Colorado Post did not define intervention. Therefore, she did not have fair notice. The argument failed. How do we know the argument failed? Because on April 21st, she was convicted of that class one misdemeanor, which in Colorado will get you three, up to 364 days, a thousand dollar fine. Last month, she was sentenced 179 days of house arrest, just under six months. So that's what happens if you go to trial, or I should say that's an example of what could happen if an officer takes that to trial. Um, what can we do with respect to the duty to intervene? We can look to the New Orleans Police Department, which as many of you know, uh, for many years was considered to be a rather troubled police department. They were subject to federal inf intervention as well. And what they did was they came up with a peer intervention program called EPIC, which is an acronym for ethical policing is it's courageous. What they did was they changed the focus because I think, and this is just my perception, nobody in New Orleans has said this, be clear on that, this is just my perception. I think what they did was they realized that officers would be reluctant to stick their necks out for someone who was thought to be a gang member, someone who's thought to be a drug dealer, et cetera, et cetera. So what they did was they changed the focus. They said, don't worry about the subject. Let's focus on your brother and sister officer. If you see your partner, you see your colleague who's about to do something that could cost them their job or perhaps even their freedom, aren't you loyal enough to them that you're going to try and stop it while you can? The, the emphasis is on saving your partner's career. And it worked. The EPIC program is very successful in New Orleans. Street cops have bought into it. And again, my personal opinion only, I believe the reason they got the buy-in from the street cops was that shift in focus from the subject to their fellow officer. Um, Christy Lopez and Jonathan Roney, they were both involved in the federal oversight in New Orleans. They took the concepts from EPIC, they built upon it, they added in some work from the psychologist, Dr. Staub. They came up with Project ABLE. You might have heard about this. Their goal is to provide eight hours of ABLE training to every police officer in the country at no cost to the officer or the agency. They do have, uh, they, they've done some good work, but the work continues. You, know, you may have heard of ABLE coming to your state. If not, the uh, website is there for your reference. Keep in mind that while we're talking about force today, the duty to intervene applies to any constitutional deprivation. It applies to unlawful detention, false arrest, First Amendment activities. So I think we need to be aware of that because there are certainly some policy and training implications there. Officer created jeopardy. Um, officer created jeopardy is a doctrine that's getting more and more attention. It basically means that an otherwise reasonable use of force can be rendered unreasonable by the officer's actions leading up to that use of force. Um, Cynthia Lee has written about it extensively, as well as Seth Stoughton. They're both law professors. Again, it's broader than the moment in time. It's broader than the final frame. It looks at what happened prior to the force. It's being talked about a lot more recently, but it's not new. You can see people have been writing about it for over 20 years. Again, that's a pretty good sum of, summary of the idea of officer created jeopardy, meaning what they did in the moments leading up to that use of force can make that otherwise reasonable use of force unreasonable. Some agencies have started to recognize it. You'll see the Seattle Police Department policy excerpt there. Um, sometimes people respond to that and say, okay, well, I understand that, but that's Seattle. 
Seattle, they have a little different perspective than most agencies. So I'm not particularly convinced just because Seattle has adopted it in their policy. Okay, fair enough. We'll just say the same thing about the Los Angeles Police Department. I think you can make a pretty compelling argument that the Los Angeles Police Department has a much different perspective than Seattle, yet they have adopted this concept of officer-created jeopardy in their policy as well. Um, courts talking about officer-created jeopardy going back to 1995. And again, it's a matter of perspective, but if you think about the Tenth Circuit in the 90s, um, I think it's fair to say that they were probably neutral or slightly pro-police, and they were acknowledging officer-created jeopardy at that time. Um, Cynthia Lee talking about it again, saying that the Supreme Court could have ruled on it, but they didn't. To the best of my knowledge, Cynthia Lee is the only person who is clearly advocating for officer-created jeopardy to be applied in the criminal context. Uh, there's a quote from one of her Law Review articles where she explicitly states that. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't gotten much traction, but be advised that the idea is out there. She's floating it, and it's getting you know more attention every year. Um, shooting to incapacitate back in 21, LaGrange, Georgia, trading this as an option. Uh, the journalist is correct when he said it challenged decades of police orthodoxy. First of its kind in Georgia could well be the first in the nation. That's uh, certainly not an understatement. Uh, a break from generations of American law enforcement training. So what's the concern with shooting to incapacitate. My concern is probably the same one that many of you have, and that are the, the limitations of human performance under the stress of a critical incident. So let's look at police shooting accuracy. We find this study from 2018, Donner and Popovich at Loyola. They tell us that we started looking at accuracy in the 70s, and at that time, your big cities were hitting about 22 to 42 percent, even the best of them well under half. Uh, the Police Foundation 87 put out the hit rates from the six largest police departments the previous year. Uh, they are in order of hit rate, not population or agency size. What you can see, again, Houston at the top, still well below half, and New York City below a quarter. Uh, in their study, they looked at the Dallas Police Department shootings from 2003 to 2017. During that time, the Dallas Police Department went from about 3,600 sworn officers to about 3,000, which is a pretty significant gap. They pulled out 231 officer-involved shootings, and they isolated 149 that involved a single officer and a single subject. In those 149 shootings, Dallas officers fired 354 rounds. 35% of the rounds struck the subject. 54% of the officers struck subjects at least once. One officer fired 23 rounds, and they all missed. And at first blush, that might sound funny, and, and we all tend to chuckle about that until we think and we understand, we realize that that means 23 bullets went down range and did not hit their intended target. Um, some points from the Dallas study. Again, it's a very small sample size, so we want to be careful about generalization. But they said that black subjects were significantly less likely to be hit than white subjects, non white officers less likely to be accurate. Incidents that took place during daylight were much more likely to result in subjects being hit and officers were more accurate when shooting at unarmed subjects. Another uh, body of work that talks about this was the RAND study from 2008, Bernie Rosker and his colleagues. This was a much larger work. It dealt with many other aspects of firearms beyond accuracy. So I encourage you, if you have any interest, this is a great resource. But pulling out what they talked about with respect to accuracy, they looked at 1,332 firearms discharges from 99 to 06. The NYPD had about 37,000 officers during that time. And they found that the hit rates were dependent on distance, um, up to about 37% when they were close in and 23 when they were um, further out than seven yards. And the circumstances, whether or not fire was being returned, also had an effect on their accuracy. Um, some more stats there that uh, Kevin Maloney was quoted at the end of 17. Um, some information there from Chicago. I know we're running out of time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but you have access to all this. No surprise with the findings of, of this narrative review of 
marksmanship. So again, my point there is that as, as police leaders, as elected officials, as community members, we have to recognize the practical limits of human performance in high stress situations. So we have to manage our own expectations regarding police use of force, particularly during critical incidents. Um, again, we're, we're running low on time here. Um, so I'm gonna skip through the de-escalation stuff. And, and there we are. There's my contact information. Again, questions, comments, concerns, feel free to reach out if you don't want to uh, raise a question here today. And once again, I appreciate the opportunity extended to me by NACOL to present, and I appreciate you all taking time out of your schedules to um, listen to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, for that presentation. And it absolutely looks like we're gonna have to have you back. Um, because there's a lot more information we need to get through. Unfortunately, we are at time, um, but uh, Ashley's um, contact information is was in the presentation. The presentation is also included in the attendee hub. And I think that um, uh, Ashley would be happy to answer any questions that you might have offline as well. Um, so I just want to take a moment to extend my appreciation to you, Ashley, for joining us today and sharing your expertise and knowledge with the oversight community. Um, I, I know you're aware that NACOL would not do what it does without you and all of the others who are so willing to come to the community and share um, information with us. So thank you for that. And of course, I have to thank, although Jason's um, not on screen anymore, I would like to thank Jason for his work on this year's webinar series, um, which just keeps coming. It's um, a really great series this year. And of course, I must thank all of those in the audience today um, for taking time out of your day to join us um, and enhance your knowledge around um, this issue. Uh, additional information about the August installment of this year's webinar series will be coming out shortly, so please watch your inbox for additional information, not only on when the event will occur, but how you can register for it. Also, do not forget to register for NACOL's 29th annual conference, which will be taking place November 12th through the 16th in Chicago, Illinois. Remember to register soon so that you can take advantage of our early registration discounts. For more information, please visit our website at NACOL.org. Uh, for those of you um, here today, thank you so much. For those who watch the recording, we appreciate you as well. And we look forward to being with all of you next time. Thank you so much and have a great day.